welcome to the Learning Reinvented podcast brought to you by myself, James Politilo, and the team from The Learning Effect. There are lots of learning podcasts out there, so we wanted to do something slightly different. In this episode, we'll be taking a fresh look at inclusive leadership. I am delighted to welcome Gary Brown to the podcast to share his thoughts, knowledge and expertise. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, James. Good to be here. Gary, I really appreciate you taking some time out to join us today. Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell them a little bit about yourself? Uh, Yeah, sure. Um, So my name is Gary Brown. I am the Head of Learning and Development at Nestle um, UK and Ireland. Um, I've been doing that role for, I suppose, about four, nearly four years now. Um, And my background really is I have been at Nestle for quite a long time. It's actually my 25th year next year. But the majority of my career actually I spent in operations um, in supply chain. Um, so I've got a slightly different background maybe to maybe to a typical um, HR or, or L&D person. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about who I am. Um, I would say that a few years ago I moved into a developmental space because I was really aware that what motivates me and drives me actually is um, people development and in particular human behavior like why do we do what we do and how does that impact um our behavior in the work in the workplace um i suppose in particular around that um you know how behavior drives performance really so that's a a potted history i would say james in terms of who i am and what i do fabulous and i know you're joining us today to share some thoughts you've sort of generated through some of your studies and some of the research you've done so do you want to share a little bit more about what you've been researching and what that's led you to to consider and find out yeah sure i mean yeah, yeah. so so i've been doing some research as part of my master's program around um inclusive leadership and this is a topic that i've been really interested in um and doing some work internally in my day job if you want to call it that um, and so part of my role really is about um, developing the leaders within our organisation um, and the idea of and the kind of growth of research around areas like inclusive leadership and psychological safety in particular, um, I think are really interesting. Um, so my research kind of centres around that stuff. Um, and, and the reason that's kind of important, I think, is that, um, you know, the big picture, if you like, is that the the world is you know changing so fast everybody knows that and, and it's not going to slow down any in any kind of um way or sense um anytime soon so the concept that um you know leaders are heroic figures who know everything is such an outdated notion that i think that the the growth of concepts like inclusive leadership behaviors and psychological safety are really about how do leaders develop the right capabilities and skills to get the best out of teams and in particular diverse groups of teams because i think the other strand of research that plays into this is that um is that idea of cognitive diversity i.e the teams with the broadest um perspectives and lived experiences and bring more to the table they have more raw material to uh to innovate with and um, but you only make the best out of that raw material if you've got the right environments which is where things like psychological safety and stuff come into it so I, I think that um this area has grown a lot and is i would sort of describe it as coming into the mainstream of business now as, as like you know some of these concepts are starting to be well understood um, and the links even between if a leader displays inclusive leadership behaviors they'll grow psychological safety and teams with higher psychological safety outperform other teams i think those kind of links are actually very well established now i think what's probably a little bit less understood um, and the, if you like the gap in the research that i was looking at was um surprisingly in amongst all of that stuff um there isn't really a lot of research that sort of points to the fact or or explores whether um, being an inclusive leader is easier if you are like me. So so what I mean by that is, you know, you will see a lot of the research talking about the fact that um, leading groups of people that are diverse is actually harder 
right and that makes logical sense because you know people are different perspectives you know um but there isn't a lot of actual research that will talk about that particular thing about if i'm if you're like me in my team i actually find it easier to connect with you to be inclusive towards you etc um so that was really the kind of um the, the kind of um gap if you like that i was um i was interested in um and like you know just maybe to, to kind of pull out a little bit of some of the things of why is that interesting like the um there's a thing called homophily which is like one of the most uh well studied and and robustly studied um human phenomenon and basically it's about um the tendency of all of us as humans to gravitate towards people that are like us and um, so it's an incredibly human trait um, and really what i was interested in is if we know that inclusive leadership behaviors lead to greater psychological safety and we also know that higher degrees of psychological safety drive performance then how do, what's the impact of um, exploring if your team is like me is it easier to be an inclusive leader that's really the kind of gap that i was interested in in terms of the study if that makes sense yeah i think you know it's it's a really interesting area and you know talking about that homophily and yeah but we gravitate towards people who are like us i think there's lots of terms you've used in there that are clearly very relevant and known by some people but as you said this is coming into the mainstream so we may have listeners who are who've heard these terms maybe yeah. people who use these terms and maybe don't really understand them as well so I just want to under, unpick some of those things that you've talked about so sure let's start with you know whether it's inclusive leadership or psychological safety because those can mean very different things to very different people and in very different organizations and you know I've, I've seen sometimes you, you know it becomes a bit of a fad of oh we'll, we'll just do inclusive leadership without yeah, really sure. understanding what that means so do you want to give us a bit of a dive yes. into what those concepts mean and then we can move on to some, uh, some absolutely of absolutely I mean I, I think if we if we you know, let's start with some definitions I mean if if we think about inclusive leadership um you know there's lots of different literature out there but but the best I would say research um, out there would really define inclusive leadership as ha having two big component parts to it uh, the first is valuing difference so you know do I really value what difference brings to the team okay which starts to kind of play to that homophily challenge let's say um, and the second is the ability to um, foster belonging so what that really means is my behaviours as a leader, um, they actually encourage people to feel that they are connected to the team and that they belong in the team. So value in difference and fostering belonging, they're really the two big um, component parts of inclusive leadership. Um, and you can probably start to see the connections, I think, when we start to define psychological safety, because, um, you know, psychological safety, if we picked out, I don't know, two of the biggest researchers and all of their work around it amy edmondson would be you know the the one that's probably most famous associated to psychological safety um and she would define it as something along the lines of um you know feeling safe to speak up without fear of retribution right so feeling that i can offer uh, my opinion uh without um fear of come back or retribution or being you know um derived derided in any way that kind of thing um and the other person i'd probably point to in this arena is a guy called dr tim clark um and he has done some really cool work in psychological safety taking it a step further in my opinion anyway um he outlines the four stages of psychological safety um and his definition of psychological safety i think is pretty interesting because he calls it um an environment of rewarded vulnerability right which, which basically means you know it's an environment where if i like engage in a vulnerable act i'm going to be rewarded for it right so what what does he mean by vulnerable acts well you know asking a question is a vulnerable act right because i don't quite know the answer i'm putting myself out there you know and making a contribution giving a different point of view um you know challenging the status quo right that's a vulnerable act right so the point is you're it's an environment of rewarded vulnerability you're really encouraging people to do that and you're you that's really what 
a psychologically safe environment is about and just to kind of outline his four stages what he talks about is that to have a psychologically safe environment you need to feel included that's the first stage so if you don't feel included you know you're kind of out of the game in the first instance um you then progress on to learner safety which is where you start to feel safe to actually engage in learning acts you know clarifying things questions etc you then move on to um contributor safety which is where you feel now I feel really safe that I can offer my point of view and perspective, etc. Uh, and then the kind of culminating stage, which is where he talks about it, you really get into the innovation space um, is challenger safety. So that means you really can, you know, offer a different point of view. So so that's, you know, there, there's loads of depth underneath that, James, you know, like his work is so good. I would absolutely encourage people to, to look at to look at that. But I think if with those definitions of inclusive leadership, and psychological safety i think hopefully people can see the connection there because what you're saying is my my behavior um as a leader if i'm inclusive i'm illustrating that i'm valuing difference and i'm encouraging people you know to feel that they belong and your kind of output if you like is levels of psychological safety because people are engaging in those vulnerable acts in that environment they're feeling safe to kind of have their voice out there question and challenge and that's obviously what drives performance, right? Because it's the challenge of the status quo that drives innovation, as an example. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I'm just reflecting back as you're speaking some of the businesses and organisations I've been in in the past. And, you know, you see, I'd see almost pockets in some organisations that are probably the antithesis of everything you've said. But there's maybe a leader in there who's fostering that environment, despite everything going on around them. And then conversely, there's, you know, you can have that leader who's creating something again, you know, you might have inclusive leadership generally across an organization, but one individual is creating that environment which doesn't have those behaviors. And you get all sorts of different things across the piece there. And I know certainly in times in my career, I found the only people who could speak out in certain environments were the ones who didn't worry about being safe, who didn't really want to belong because mm -hmm. you had to be the outsider and you had to not worry about your job and everything else because it was you know that was how things got broken but you know and changed because someone had to speak up but yeah. the people who fitted in were the people who conformed and were like everyone else so it's a really you know I'm fascinated to know where your research has taken you because I can I can see you know just from you introducing it some of the themes and questions I'd be wanting to dig under and and, and understand more of yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, even though we've laid it out in, you know, I know they're quite detailed, but they are quite clear terms, right? You know, I think the thing we have to be really cognizant of is this is not easy, right? What we're really talking about is that, you know, me as a leader, my individual behaviour, right? And there are so many things that play into that, right? How I feel about the role that I'm in, you know, have I got in an imposter syndrome you know all of these things play into that because but but in the end it plays out in terms of my behavior to other people and and like you know i often when i kind of get into these sorts of discussions with people in some of the leadership programs we run you know people have so many different takes on leadership right um m my honest opinion is that if you boil it down to its kind of essence you know what is leadership right it's it's influence and impact on other people and that happens through your behavior, right? So the reason I kind of personally gravitate so much towards inclusive leadership as a concept is that I think, again, in the world that we work in today, you know, this idea that you need to value difference, you know, and, and, that, and that's, that in itself is hard, right? Because it's easier to work with people that are like you. Just back to that homophily point that we made earlier on. Yeah, and, and it's actually, what we seek as humans right so if you know it's a it's a it's a well so studied social phenomenon because we all like want to be part of a tribe we all want to be in the in group and then we gravitate towards people so valuing difference in itself is quite challenging for leaders i think because it you know it, it infers that you want to bring in people that are not going to agree with you which is a challenge right for for, for leaders so you've got to be open to that is the first point um, and I think the second element of it, of the fostering belonging bit, 
it's that's challenging too because again it's easier to foster a sense of belonging if everybody's like you you know if you like football right and everybody in your team likes football brilliant you got something to talk about right but imagine the one person who who doesn't like football right how are they feeling when everybody's kind of chatting about you know the games at the weekend or whatever you know they're probably not getting to the first stage of psychological safety because they don't feel included so so my, my point here really james is that i think even before we move on to some of the nuances about difference and stuff in teams, I think leaders have really got to think about their behaviour and and certainly some of the work that we've been starting to do beyond the kind of concept bit is to really think about how that plays out in everyday moments. Because what we're really talking about here is like, you know, how I interact with people, you know, and there are, there are, there are moments that matter, right? So like, when I have my check-ins with my people that I might have every month or week or however leaders do it with their people. Like, what's the tone of conversation that I'm using? You know, how much am I talking versus allowing them to speak? What's my coaching skills like? Some of it is kind of, you know, not new stuff, classic leadership, but but I think the inclusive um, leadership concept really makes you think about your behaviour in those key moments, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I, I think it's really nicely set the scene in terms, you know, huge levels of complexity, but you can walk those through and give that personal ownership back to behaviour. And there is something that we can own and do something about. So let's come back to your research. So do you want to mm-hmm. sort of give us, you know, obviously your interest in this area, this is, you know, through your master's, you've led into this research to want to give us a bit more context of what you're looking at and how you were looking at that. Yeah, so 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 kind of with all of that having set the scene you know this this interesting link between uh, inclusive leadership and psychological safety um th- again back to the kind of gap that i was interested in i was interested in this you know how can you really explore the idea of um homophily you know that kind of concept of like if you're like me you know is it easier to be an inclusive leader so that was kind of my one of my hypotheses going into it basically right so how do you prove that so, so what what I did is um I looked at um uh, it was a quantitative study. So basically, what that means is we um we did a, a survey with a, a whole bunch of people. Um, did it with around about I think it was about three hundred and fifty people in the end, something like that, across um certainly my network. So a lot of it was was internal in my company, but also external. So we did some of it with um other organisations too. And what we asked them to do was actually um fill in a, a questionnaire reflecting on themselves in terms of how they feel about the inclusive leadership behaviours of their direct line manager and how they feel in terms of psychological safety. And then we also captured um, the how different they perceived their line manager to be. So what I mean by that is um, in the survey, there were categories of difference. So, for example, my line manager is a different gender to me. Um, they're more than 20 years older than me. They, um, I perceive them to have a different uh, religious perspective or ethnicity. Or So what we were doing is really exploring, you know, what were the different characteristics between that relationship between the individual and their line manager, if that makes sense. And I should say that like the 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 questionnaire was based on um, well used, robustly defined scales um, by experts that that have already been established. So that was all good from my perspective. That was great because they already existed. Um, so basically, by by capturing all of that, um, what you're able to then do is start to do some interesting correlation work about you know what are the patterns that you see within that. Um, and, and the first thing really to establish was that everything that we've just discussed, you know, that idea that if you have um, inclusive leadership behaviours, if you display inclusive leadership behaviours, it will lead to increased psychological safety. That was hypothesis one. Right. So you've got to establish that, first of all, before you do anything. And I'm pleased to say that that was very, very clear. Um, so what we saw um, when I'd done the the, uh, the analysis around that was there was a very strong correlation between um, experience of inclusive leadership behaviours and how people feel from a psychological safety point of view. Um, 
Uh, and then the next thing then was if we've established that, it was really to understand, um, OK, so what is that impact of difference? So I looked at this in a couple of different ways. So the first thing um, we did was we kind of split the groups and said, OK, so those that said there were no difference between me and my line manager and those that said there was some form of difference, do we see a difference in terms of the correlation of the scores? Right. Um, and the answer to that was also a very positive resounding yes in the sense that um, we could see that those that had said that they were the same in effect as their line manager very you know similar people um, experienced both increased inclusive leadership and increased psychological safety compared to those who said there was some form of difference so now, so now that we've established that you know, there is a difference between those categories of people, people that think they are very similar to their line manager um, and those that think they, there are differences that exist. The next thing was to kind of go um, a, st a step um, further and actually examine if we started to look at, well, how many levels of difference actually start to make um, to, to kind of um, create a picture of um, impact, let's say. Um, so really what we're exploring in here is the concept of intersectionality. So to bring in another kind of, you know, researchy term, let's put it that way. Intersectionality is really um, uh, a construct that is about exploring how differences interact with each other and create, you know, even more marginalisation for people, right? And um, that's a term that the intersectionality was um, a, a term that was kind of born out of social justice movements and stuff like that. Um, and really, again, is, is a term that I think people will, will see coming into diversity and inclusion work um, more, more commonly too. Um, the principle here is that um, actually when we start to think about diverse groups of people, we don't just want to categorise people as one thing right because nobody's one thing we're all a multiple of things right so we're not just a gender we're not just an ethnicity we're not just but what intersectionality promotes is the idea that um multiple levels of difference um can compound marginalization because people get you know two three four five times over marginalized right that's the idea behind it so mm -hmm. what, what it's promoting is the idea to think about diversity more in a respecting everybody's individual circumstances rather than just categorizing people if that makes sense um so to bring it back to the study the idea here was um that intersectionality the, the hypothesis if you like actually magnifies um the difference that we see so what we did in this part of the study i say we i um i looked at three groups of people this time so what we did is we said okay so if we've got uh, one group, which is I'm very similar to my line manager. Then I've got a second group, which is there's one level of difference between myself and my line manager. And then there's a third group, which kind of represents intersectionality in a really, really simple way. Um, these This group is people that said there's more than two levels of difference between myself and my line manager. And then we explored feelings of psychological safety and inclusive leadership in those three groups and lo and behold what, what i saw was that the the first group where the similarity exists obviously um saw the highest levels of those two things um the second group um there was a dip but they were so if there was one level of difference there was a slight um level of uh, there was less in terms of inclusive leadership and psychological safety but the intersectionality group had a much lower level of psychological safety and inclusive leadership so so the point of the study was what it was showing was that when we actually test those hypotheses what it suggests is that the impact of difference between line manager and individual is actually very big so what it suggests is that idea that um you know i gravitate towards people that whole homophily phenomenon does exist in line manager and employee relationships right and that actually aligns very well to some of the literature around and studies around homophily because 
to be really practical about it, there's, there's one I remember in this um, one that I came across where they talked about a study of people joining organisations and about how they were more productive if um, they like early on, if they felt that the people that they were working with were like them. Right. And if you just think about that for a minute, they were more productive. What that suggests is that they were they were less scared. Right. They felt kind of like they naturally belonged straight away. So if that individual was different, you know, the flip side of that is they're less productive. Right. Now, that's because they don't feel they belong. Now, that, that doesn't mean you can't do something about it. What it should be suggesting to line managers in particular is that when you've got a new person joining your organisation, back to that value difference point, what are you doing to go out of your way to make that individual welcome and help to foster that feeling of belonging, if you see what I mean? So if we really bring it back to the everyday behaviours, what it should be promoting is that idea that, you have to respect everybody's individual circumstances and really kind of help them be be very proactive in terms of how you help them to feel that they belong because that is as i said earlier on the first stage of that whole psychological safety phenomenon right they've got to feel included and that they belong in the organization it's it's interesting as you you know you're talking about those multifaceted things just between an individual and a line manager and then you're overlaying team dynamics in there as well, you know, so 100%. Yeah, you know, hugely complex. And, you know, it's almost, as you said, I, I don't I see me being similar to my line manager, similar to my teammates or whatever it happens to be. I see one level of difference. And then, you know, my, my brain's spinning off. Are there particular types of difference that lead to more levels of not feeling included or not you know so you know you can start spin and then Absolutely. thinking well actually as soon as I start seeing one or more what's happening to the individual what's happening to the manager yeah. is it about you know confidence and and w- w- again so I'm, I'm just spinning so there's loads of stuff spinning around in my head which I'm sure is why you're interested in this but it's yeah, yeah I think uh, and, and I think that's right James I mean you know even in what I've described you know The structure of my study for, you know, this master's program was relatively simple, right? So we're talking about some pretty complex um, topics and, you know, constructs and theories and whatever. Um, But what what I tested for was relatively simple. So what I mean by that is we're just really teasing out in a really simple perceived way, which is an important point as well, perceived difference because the perceived word is interesting as well, right? Because it's like, well, I perceive that they're different from me, not like I actually know, right? Um, and, and the whole point was really to kind of illustrate, you know, through proper and um, quantitative methods that this is a thing, right? There is an impact here. I think, I think to your point, James, you know, what you do with that information um, is you bring it back to everyday behaviors. And you bring it back to valuing difference and you bring it back to if I'm a line manager, particularly even if I'm a line manager that really buys into and supports everything associated to diversity, equity and inclusion. Right. You know, what we should also be thinking about is not categorizing people and it just as a label their gender i need to have more i need to have more women in my team right you know i need to have more ethnically diverse people it's not really about that it's about individuality right and if and if and everybody's individual lived experience is different and i think i suppose if there was one thing from a very personal perspective out of this study you know that i could convey it would be that i would urge line managers to really think like that you know actually think about um an individual as an individual with an individual set of lived circumstances not you know a category or whatever and and i and to bring that back to performance which is the bit that i the bit i said at the beginning that really interests me is like how this behavior stuff plays out in performance um you know the work of like matthew syed is great right so he's got a book called rebel ideas which is awesome right i would tell everybody to read that book um but really what he talks about and that is this phenomenon of cognitive diversity right so the point is with that is you need to have people that think differently in a team right 
Now, thinking differently is of, often informed by people's lived experiences. So it does mean, you know, people with from diverse lived experiences. But but the reason I say that is that, you know, let's take an example. If you had, um, I don't know, a bunch of people with this with very different um, ethnic characteristics in a team, right? On the face of it, that would suggest that's a diverse team. But what if they all went to the same school and they all went to the same uni and they all had the same, you know, then and I know that's an extreme example. But my point is, it's not always going to give you, you know, cognitive diversity in a team. So, again, the, the, the point of, of this kind of study is really to kind of get line managers to be thinking about individuality. How well do I know, you know, my the individuals in my team what they live what they bring to the table really through their lived experiences because it's it's uncovering their unique strengths if you see what i mean and giving them a voice in the team that's really what kind of drives the performance angle of of diversity through all of these things that we've, that we've talked about if that makes sense yeah and i think that's a, you know you made that point but it, it's it's a really important one that people are not their labels and those labels are not what you see so you know Mm. what you see is not what you get what's first presented is not what you get etc so it's it's and i'm like you one of those people who's really interested in people so i want to find out people's stories i want to find out more about them what makes them tick what what they've been an experience that i can learn from you know and in some ways it's a, a selfish thing for me that i want to learn and know as much as i can and i can't do that all myself so speaking to people from different backgrounds and you know i've seen studies in the past about you know people's social circles and how homogenous those are and um you know one of my reflections on what we've been through in the past few years is that you know we got locked away in our own little circles we spend less time outside of our circles commuting going into the workplace spending time across a broader range of an organization just because we're not in that space we tend to be doing one-on-one interactions more you know in desk bound jobs of course that again people's lived experiences people think everyone had the same lived experience of lockdown or COVID. you know it's the same Absolutely. thing you know and it's having that understanding and that empathy and and seeking to try and understand and explore and create that opportunity to for people to speak rather than assume and I think there's a whole load of behaviors there around just curiosity that almost underpin a lot of these things because you can't just assume or look and again I've seen this a lot in the leadership stuff I've done earlier in my career about people are not really interested in anyone else there's a lot of people who are just interested in validating their opinion or listening to respond And, and again it comes down to the same issue to me that we've got to have those underpinning behaviors as you've talked about that show and and they're not necessarily to do overtly with inclusive leadership they're just to do with good interpersonal skills in some way and building those in I, i would agree with you i mean i think you mentioned two you know behavioral things that are super important in this which is um you know, empathy and curiosity, you said, and, and that that's actually, we, we use that a lot in the work that I do internally around inclusive leadership, because they are, they're, and courage is probably another one that I would say in there as well, because I think that they are, this stuff is not easy, I'll say it again, you know, I said it earlier on in our conversation, it's not easy, you know, and, and a lot of what we're describing here is, um, it links to, you know, leadership concepts that have been in in leadership development forever and a day things like emotional intelligence and so and um, self-awareness right that they are the cornerstones of becoming a leader so you know anybody who is a leader knows that they went through a transition from leading themselves and it was all about them and it was all fine because they knew what they could do towards then having to leading other people and it is it's you know in my opinion one of the probably the biggest transition you have to make because you have to start employing you have to start being aware of your own impact and you have to start employing emotional intelligence in a way that's going to you're going to be a bit more skillful in the way that you interact with yourself it's not about changing you as an individual but it is about knowing your preferences and how you how you show up to people and impact other people because 
as I say, in my opinion, leadership is all about influence and you're influencing people all the time, whether that's the people in your team, whether that's the people above you or stakeholders or whatever, whatever. So so I guess bring, bringing it back to, to kind of the, the conversation around inclusive leadership, th- th- these things are, are quite important in the world that we work in now because, you know, the other thing that's really interesting in this space to me is that, you know, diversity is a fact. You cannot run away from it, right? The, the workforce is becoming more and more diverse. You know, it, it, it's a fact of life. And if, we, if we're going to work in places that reflect the societies that we live within, then we have to develop the leadership skills that are going to help diverse people to thrive, right, in environments. And that's really what this whole topic is about, is it, it's not necessarily to your point, James, I think some of this stuff is not necessarily brand new leadership stuff, but it probably has got a slightly different perspective, right? Which is about, you know, how do you really help diverse groups of people to thrive? But not not just so it's a lovely working environment, so that there's performance at the end of it, right? So that there's innovation, so that there's, you know, businesses thrive too, if you see what I mean. Because the flip side of it is, by the way, if you have a big drive on diversity and representation, but you don't do anything about helping leaders to develop inclusive leadership skills, then that's actually the worst place to be. You're going to go backwards is what's going to happen in that scenario. Yeah, I, th- I think you need that skill set to be able to manage that cognitive diversity, to to bring that to be positive and not just conflicting and divisive in in terms yeah. of, of how that works so i think that you know there's huge amounts of skills for leaders in in looking at any team that they're managing so one thing on your research so you went in with a set of hypotheses and you seem to have proved those hypotheses did you did anything Indeed. surprise you or you know what what else did you learn through the study that you know yeah, maybe I mean, is an area you want to go differently or Look at yeah, I mean, I, th- I think um, so. So the the three hypotheses that that were, if I can even say that word, hypotheses <laughs> that were that were lined up, um, they were indeed all proved, um, and, and they were kind of really informed by the body of literature. So when you do one of these things, obviously, you kind of the literature review really informs your hypotheses, and then you test them, right? So so. The, the reassuring thing there is that all of the literature that's out there, you know, it really make, gives me confidence that the conversation we're having today is, you know, fully grounded in in scientific, well-researched um, content. And um, was there anything that we didn't that, that, that I found that I was surprised about? Yeah, there, there was one little thing, actually, where um, when. We, when I sliced the data, one of the ways I looked at it was I looked at um, the difference between those that said they were the same and those that had one level of difference. And I did a particular cut of data where I looked at that from a, a female perspective. Right. And what it what it didn't show was a sig- statistically significant difference between the group of people that said that they were the same and a small subset of the data that showed um, a gender difference, right? Now, it, it, part of the reason it might not have been statistically significant is because we were starting to get down into kind of really small numbers. So that's part of the problem. But the, the thing that that didn't kind of ring true to me in, in my head is that, you know, we, we often hear that, um, and there is lots of, again, research around this, that the, the women being managed by men sometimes creates um you know a a different experience let's put it that way in terms of psychological safety and inclusive leadership that none of that showed up really um in the data that i had so so just to be really clear what i mean by that is we couldn't really see a gender um impact if you like for for women um having a having a lesser experience when reporting to um to, to men if that makes sense but I do think that that might have been to do with the, the subset of the data not being big enough. But that's probably the only thing that I was surprised by, James, that we didn't really see in, in the data that that gender difference coming through. And did you see anything just, you know, traditionally it's been, you know, glass ceiling for women, mm. ethnic minorities, et cetera, mm. getting through an organisation. Did you see anything the other way around in terms of, 
you know women managing men i'm you know just interested as no no i mean and and in fairness i I didn't cut the data in 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 that level of detail i think um in in the kind of recommendations for future um research what i talked about was the fact that um it would be interesting to do more study work on identified intersecting groups by which i mean you know we might look at i don't know ethnically diverse females and their experience of inclusive leadership and um, psychological safety and what you might do that would be more interesting actually to build on what this study was showing is do some qualitative work so rather than just so what i've done is quant is is, um quantitative so it's correlation work right but actually you could take a group like that who, who are living at the intersections right so they're female and they're ethnically diverse what is their experience and do that in a more qualitative way and um, so you know some of the things you're getting at are like exactly right i think james but that we, we couldn't see that in this in the scope of this study that would be where you'd go next the idea would really be to explore um you know those those intersecting lived experiences within an organization and do the because what what intersectionality is really saying is that you have to be careful about how um power and systems work in organizations to create um doubly oppressed um intersections if that makes sense so kind of really examining the the lived experiences of those intersecting groups is really one of the uh, recommendations really to kind of go uh, next with this sort of thing and you've you've touched on it with the sorts of things you could be doing in organizations and where these things could be a risk or not but if if you're sort of taking that step back and saying from what you know now and validating and you know and reassuring yourself that a lot of the research out there is is true and based in in sound science etc what would you be saying to people they should be doing differently or thinking about in their organizations yeah i mean there's a couple of things i think at different levels actually so at an organizational level um, one of the really interesting things is, is there's some studies out there about um, the maturity journey around diversity, um, equity and inclusion in, in organisations. And, and, and at one point, um, there is a phase where some organisations um, have reached the level of maturity in the sense that they've got things like employee resource groups right, or networks. So they've got networks around gender, ethnicity, disability, neuro, neurodiversity, whatever it may be. Um, but actually in that maturity journey, sometimes what happens is they unintentionally compete against each other. So, you know, the, and that might be driven by um, forces within the organisation. Like, as an example, there might just be one budget, for example, for all of those resource groups. So, so what, what can happen is they reach a stage where kind of unintentionally they're competing against each other, like maybe for that budget, for example. So at an organisational level, even just starting to talk about the idea of intersectionality, you know, is is a good thing to do because it, what it starts to do is um, strip away some of that, you know, unintended consequence of competing against each other by actually kind of recognising everybody's unique differences. Because not only, you know, are you in this category, but you might be in this one too. As we said earlier on, we all have, you know, multiple uh, categories, if you want to call it that, that that we live within or sections. So that's kind of an organizational level, which sounds kind of simple, right? But and, and it is kind of simple, but but really having that conversation so that you're promoting the idea of uniqueness, um, value and uniqueness, as we said, in terms of um, inclusive leadership rather than categorization is, is one thing that can can help. I think at the we, we've kind of touched on this, but at the leader level, um, you know, certainly what what the route that we're taking um around inclusive leadership in my day job work if you want to put it like that is first of all like raising the understanding of some of the things we've talked about today so what does inclusive leadership mean what what does psychological safety mean how do those things interact so a lot of what we kind of talked about today but also i think most importantly this idea of bringing it back to the moments that matter so you know this is all very for some people this would be like man this is a bit you know ethereal and a bit theoretical and i totally get that 
But actually what we can do is bring this right back down to our day to day interactions with people, you know, to what level am I really thinking about my behaviour as a leader and the impact that I'm having on another individual? And particularly if that individual is very different to me. That's the whole point, right? If they have a very different view of the world, a different set of lived experiences, am I really, to use your word, curious and employing empathy to really understand their, because that's how you develop, you know, and foster those feelings of belonging, which is stepping into, I'm starting to feel psychologically safe and I'll progress through those stages that we were talking about earlier on to kind of really thrive ultimately in the in the in the team that i'm in yeah i think i think it's really interesting and the bit that always fascinates me as well is the organization structures and culture that sit around this because sometimes the people can almost change their behavior but everything else lags behind or or those things are pushing you back because you know you've talked about managing someone who's very different lots of the structures of organizations will never create that situation in the first place and Absolutely. so there are you know almost huge constraints or or legacy systems or you know inbuilt legacy ways of thinking that we don't even perceive and that might be you know just how the employers perceive that we wouldn't even and tap I think that, into some of those groups that's exactly right james and, and I, I do think it's important with this stuff to to I think sometimes, certainly in an organisational setting, I work in a big organisation, you, you kind of hear this stuff and you go, yeah, that makes sense. And then it, and then you kind of like get a bit overwhelmed. So where do you start sort of thing? So I think it's, it's important to recognise that all of this stuff is about taking small steps and making progress over time. I think that's really important so people don't feel overwhelmed. But just to pick up on your point there, um, you know, the way that I would kind of play that back, what you said is it's almost like there are systemic forces, right, that sometimes are at play when... We're all trying to do the right thing, but, you know, there are certain things, certain processes that kind of are not very inclusive that then create a bad outcome, if you see what I mean. So if we took an example, I'd say a moment that really matters as a line manager is when you recruit. So how inclusive are your recruitment practices today would be a very tangible question you can start to ask of yourself and of the organisation that you work within. Right. Um. Because, you know, if we want to talk about building more diverse organisations and then the very route where we bring people into the organisation does not have practices that, you know, allow for that and promote that. Well, you know, then obviously we're shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit. So I guess my point here is that I think with this understanding of inclusive leadership, you can start to really apply that to those key points and key moments in the map and you will uncover stuff i'm sure that that is systemically a challenge you know i could i could go on about this for it but if you if your organization does calibration of any form you know around your performance ratings or your talent um processes well what's going on then you know what's this check around bias for example that is being you know, naturally, because we're all humans, and if you're human, you are biased. But what's in place there to try and make sure that calibration, for example, is done in the most inclusive way, if that makes sense. So it kind of uncovers loads of questions, right? But that's good, because it gives you something to work with. And to my point, you, you clearly can't necessarily do everything overnight. But I think that's the point, is we're trying to provoke a different discussion about how you bring about more um inclusive cultures ultimately um, but you have to really focus on leadership behavior and day-to-day leadership behavior as a as a as a not the only start point but a massive part of the equation yeah and I think you know I was alluding as some of my experiences have been really in that recruitment space where I've seen processes that were put in to promote opportunity and diversity actually achieve exactly the opposite because they're actually almost homogenous because they're overly fair and the criteria are set and they're you know but they they then just bake in that predefined way of not opening up what we're looking for and and I love the point you made about you know you have to get creative as to how you can do calibration in a more inclusive way and I think it's having 
that belief and want to do things in a more inclusive way and then thinking about how you do those things inclusively and that's not going into a room and locking yourself away that's opening up the process and seeking feedback and seeking different opinions and that's where the you know the power of cognitive diversity comes in because getting more people in you're going to get a a different solution maybe not a better solution but you're going to get a different solution and you're going to learn and iterate and I think it's it's those things that you know maybe people can be picking up because otherwise we just roll out the same old same old things and when we're going to make very very incremental change in stuff because of that mothership of the the forces that are holding us to you know and that's it James I, I, you know again I, I say it again probably the third time this stuff is not easy right yeah. I, I think what we're what we're doing here is is often you know challenging things or turning over stones of, of things that have maybe been the same in organizations for a long time and, and and so I think it is important that that we're all realistic about that but these are the right things to do you will not you know you can either to use to, to, to pick up on what you're saying that that's that evokes an image of like glacial change right you know oh maybe we'll nudge forward a little bit in five years whereas actually I think you know really leaning into the concept of inclusive leadership is more provocative and it, it it creates when you really understand it and you really get into the kind of um okay so the the behavior on a day-to-day basis and the people processes that we follow inclusive leadership i think can really help you to challenge some of those big things that can actually make a massive difference over time in the organization but it requires courage it requires curiosity it requires empathy all the things that we were talking about earlier on so so not easy but for me you know it's why i find it so fascinating i think it's a you know it, it it's a real opportunity to create both fairer and equitable workplaces but ones that drive performance too that's what i think is most interesting about it yeah and you know it is a fascinating subject you know you you, you've said that and i totally agree and we could go in all sorts of different directions i'd love to ask you loads more questions but given where you are what's next for you in terms of your research or your thinking or areas of interest for you um so two things i mean i think um internally at um in my day job work we're doing a lot of this stuff at the moment i would say that um in my organization we're we're at the stage where we've done quite a lot of um sharing of some of these concepts and and a a bit of upskilling of starting to help some of our leaders and our broader organization understand some of the concepts but it but it takes time um we're really trying to focus on bringing that into these everyday moments that matter the you know the key interactions that we have so it's really tangible for people so very practically that means for us that we're you know we're really working hard on what are the kind of you know interventions and support and and stuff like that, that that we currently do around the whole area of leadership and how do we bring these concepts really into those 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 in, interactions so a real focus on baking in all things inclusive leadership and psychological safety into the work that we do to support our leaders that's the first thing um and I think for, for me personally, I, I've really enjoyed the research. Um, I'm actually looking to um, publish the study. So so I'm going to focus on that in um, towards the back end of this year, hopefully. Um, and then I, I, I'm, I'm interested in kind of some of the areas that I talked about in terms of the next iteration of study or what you might do with it, the recommendations. So, so I'm hoping that um, maybe over the next couple of years that I'll, I'll do a few more um studies in this field but maybe a a little bit more focused on um some of those areas of intersectionality and and lived experiences in organizations because i again i think that's a there's some interesting things that i think we could discover in there about how people um experience organizations when they live at those intersections if that makes sense yeah no it makes lots of sense and like you said there's lots of areas and and fascinating bits to look at as you go forward so if people have been inspired 
intrigued or energized by anything they've heard today and want to pick up follow you find out when your research comes out what's the best way of them getting in contact yeah i mean probably linkedin i'd say um that's that's the easiest thing um i'm on linkedin reasonably active if people are interested in the in the work that we're doing i'm always happy to talk to people in this space because it's um uh, you know i find it very interesting and it's great to hear what other organizations are doing too you know you know it's like james you know when it sometimes you 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 like to um know that you're not on your own with this kind of stuff right so if other people are kind of um thinking about things in this space and look at attacking it slightly differently yeah great to connect and, to, and talk about it yeah absolutely and i think people sharing those experiences good bad and indifferent along the journey absolutely, all yeah. different views and perspectives things they've tried research that other people may have undertaken so you know thank you very much for joining us today what we will do is make sure all of those contact details so your linkedin is in the show notes below we'll also put some of the links maybe to the books you've mentioned as well because i think you've mentioned quite a few useful resources for people who you know may want to you know tap into some other resources etc but yeah gary thank you very much for joining us thanks james pleasure thank you for listening to this episode of the learning reinvented podcast we hope you enjoyed it If you've not already done so, please follow our podcast. And if The Learning Effect can help you and your organisation, please do get in touch. You can find both James and Katie on LinkedIn and our contact details are in the show notes below.